Good morning, everybody, or hello, um, for those of you who, for whom it's no longer morning. Uh, my name's Ben Horton, and I am here today to uh, sort of introduce the latest in this international affairs webinar series um, on the lessons of history for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it's a real pleasure to welcome our latest speaker in the series, Professor Margaret, Margaret McMillan. Um, as the saying goes, Margaret is someone who needs no introduction, but I'm going to attempt one regardless. Uh, she is Professor of History at the University of Toronto, Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford, and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Uh, Margaret specialises in British imperial history and international history of the 19th and 20th centuries, and her books include Peacemakers, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919 and its attempt to end war, The War That Ended Peace, The Road to 1914, and most recently, History's People, Personalities and the Past. In 2018, Margaret gave the BBC's Wreath Lectures, exploring the relationship between war and society, um, in a series titled The Mark of Cain, which I would definitely recommend a listen uh, to. Um, and in 2019, Margaret co-edited a special issue of International Affairs, assessing the state of world politics 100 years after the Paris Peace Conference. Um, her, her article with Patrick Quinton Brown in that issue was titled The Uses of History in International Society from Paris from the Paris Peace Conference to the present. Um, and we'll be posting links to the special issue during this event. You can also find them on the IA website at www.academic.oup.com slash IA. Um, just to run through a little bit of housekeeping before we start, um, this event is on the record, no Chatham House rule today, and we're going to be filming it. Uh, it will be published later on the Chatham House website. Um, if you have any questions for Margaret, um, at any point anything arises, please do um, add it in the Q&A box uh, below at the, at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will be putting as many questions as I can to Margaret um, as this event sort of progresses. We're going to kick off now um, with a short sort of opening statement from Margaret. And then um, I may have a couple of questions and then we'll move on to to your own questions and I hope it's going to be a very interactive discussion. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Margaret now. Margaret, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much and I'm, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for your kind words. When I came to the UK for what I thought was a short trip at the beginning of March, I could not have expected that I would be sitting here staring at a computer screen talking to people who I think are both in the UK but perhaps further afield. Things have changed extraordinarily quickly, and I think we're all trying to make sense of a new world that we're in. I think what we're living through, and, and Paul Collier had a very good article about this, Paul Collier, the economist in the Times Literary Supplement recently, he said, we have to accept the fact that we're now living with radical uncertainty. And I think we're gonna to have to go on accepting that radical uncertainty. There are so many things that we don't know, the unknown unknowns. And I think we're going to have to accept that that is probably going to be the case um, for at least a year, possibly longer. So can history do anything to help us at this present juncture? I think it can, although I will say right away, I don't think history is particularly good at predictions because there are so many ways in which human events can unfold, or, or at least I think historians tend to think so. And given the rapidly changing situations in which so many of us are and in which the world is, I think, very hard to predict. What, however, I think history can do is offer useful examples, perhaps even some consolation that things will eventually get better. And I think it can also offer us warnings. It might be able to help us figure out what we need to know at the present and what we ought to be thinking about when the pandemic is under control, more under control than it is now, and when we begin to have to think about how to repair a lot of the damage that has been done, not just in terms of health, though of course that is enormous, but to our economies, to our societies, in many cases, people have lost jobs which may not come back. And so we're gonna to have to do a lot of, I think, very serious thinking about what we do next and how we try and strengthen our institutions, both nationally, but also internationally, so that we can deal with another crisis of this sort. And I, I think one thing perhaps I will predict is we will have another crisis of this sort. Um, scientists have been warning for decades now about the possibility of pandemics in a very interconnected world. And we're going to have to, I think, live with that. And we will have other crises 
as well. So how can we think usefully about what we need to do by using history? And I think what we can do is look back and say, how have countries and how has the world come through previous crises? What has helped and what hasn't? And I think there's certain things that stand out and, and the past shows this very clearly and I think we're seeing it today. Societies that are strong when a crisis hits, particularly a major crisis, with strong institutions, with a sense of community, tend to survive much better, tend to come through much better. And you can see this in war, of course, which is one of the ultimate tests of society. In the 1914-18 war, the Great War, France and Britain and Germany more or less survived the war with their societies in good order. It wasn't easy, there were terrific strains, but they were strong or relatively strong to begin with. Russia, which was not strong in 1914, fell to pieces, the regime fell to pieces under the challenges of war. Austria-Hungary, which was already deeply divided along national lines and, and class lines, also fell to pieces. And I think we saw the same thing in the Second World War. France fell in 1940, Britain did not, and that had something to do with the strength of their societies. The United States, which had been divided in the run-up to the Second World War, went into that war united because of Pearl Harbor. There was one woman in Congress who voted against the United States going to war after Pearl Harbor. She sank without a trace. I can't even remember her name. The only vote against going to war. So do we have that sort of unity and do we have that sense of a community pulling together today? And I would say the record is mixed as it was in the two world wars. One of the negative things that has happened, I think, is that the pandemic and the possible mitigation of that pandemic have been politicized. In the United States, differences on when to end the lockdown, for example, or differences over vaccine are tending to mirror differences between Democrats and Republicans. And I think the pandemic and the response of the government is being used as a weapon by both sides. And I think we're seeing something the same in the United Kingdom, where the pressure to ease the lockdown tends to overlap with those who want to get Brexit done, um, want to push the government in that direction. One of the other things I think that comes out very clearly in a crisis that it can divide you or it can bring you together is the importance of leadership. Without strong leadership, without leaders who can help to organize their societies, can find the right sort of advisors. I mean, I think one of the marks is of a, of a good leader, and I think history shows this very clearly, and I think we're seeing it again today, is that a good leader is capable of choosing strong and effective people to work with him or with her. I think that is extremely important. And I think good leaders are also capable of changing their minds. It's not always pleasant. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. But I think a good and a strong leader will say, look, this policy wasn't working. We tried it. It wasn't a mistake at the time, but we need to try something else. And I think furthermore, and this again is where history can help, a good leader is a person who will have an open mind to different possibilities, to thinking through an issue and asking the right sort of questions. And again, I think history can help with that. And we've seen in the past just how important good leadership can be. And of course, increasingly in, in our world, in the, in the world of the 20th and 21st centuries, a good leader has to be someone who can communicate, who has to be able to speak to publics in ways that make them feel that they're being included and not excluded, that they're not being talked down to, that they're actually being brought into an important discussion. I think in the First World War, what made a huge difference to both Britain and France is that you've got leaders who appeared partway through the war and took over. In this case of France, Georges Clemenceau, who became prime minister, he'd been a scourge of governments before him, but he now headed a very effective government and rallied the French and kept them together in the war. And in Britain, you've got David Lloyd George, who came into office at a very dark time in December 1916 and had the same impact, I think, on the British war effort and the British public and the public opinion as Clemenceau had had in France. Germany went down a very different road and had what was in effect a military dictatorship. And I think in the end that did not serve Germany well. And I think we're seeing today that often authoritarian governments are not all that good at responding flexibly. They don't like to admit they're wrong. They're, the tendency of, of their subordinates is to try and cover up because they might get into trouble. I tend to think, and we will have to see what this present pandemic crisis shows, I tend to think that in the long run, open democracies are going to be better and more flexible at dealing with crises because they are more open and because they have to bring the public with them.
So what do we learn about how you rebuild after catastrophes from history? Well, I've spent a lot of my, my time thinking about what happened after the First World War and what happened at the Paris Peace Conference. That peace conference, has often, it has often been said, missed a terrific opportunity to rebuild the world. I would argue the record is mixed. And I would also like to point out that the challenges they faced were absolutely enormous. If ever there was a black swan moment where a lot of unexpected things came together to create a major crisis or catastrophe, it was in 1919. Revolution in, in Russia and revolutions breaking out all over Europe nationalisms, trying to establish new countries on the ground and often fighting with each other, illness. Of course, we all remember the Spanish influenza epidemic, which may have killed as many as 50 million people around the world in the post-1919 period. But there were other illnesses caused by malnutrition, caused by poverty, caused by lack of medical care, typhoid, typhus, cholera, all these were causing problems for the earth. You also had economies shattering in the center of Europe, Austria-Hungary falling to pieces, shattered a number of economies. Russia was in civil war and the Ottoman Empire was about to collapse. And so I think you had a very, very difficult situation. Could the peacemakers have done better in dealing with it? You can argue, yes, they could have done. Did they treat Germany in a way that was likely to bring about peace? As a very influential French political figure, Jacques Bonville, said in the 1930s, the trouble with the treatment of Germany, it was too kind for all that it was cruel. In other words, it wasn't tough enough, it was not enforced, and the Germans came away with a deep sense of resentment and the ability to react to what they felt was an unfair peace treaty. I think you could also argue that the United States could have done more post-1919 to help get Europe's economy going again, to help build a stronger world, but it was not the United States of post-1945. And the mood in the United States was that they had come into a war, which most of them hadn't really, I think, wanted when they, when they came in. They'd done their bit, and it was up to Europe to get on with rebuilding itself. The trouble was that Europe failed to agree on ways to rebuild itself after 1919. The reparations issue, the attempts to squeeze money out of Germany because France was desperate, Britain's attempts to call in its war loans because it too was facing severe financial problems, the pressure from the United States on the European countries, especially Britain, to pay back their war debts, all this meant that Europe's economy, far from getting going again, divided along national lines, and there was considerable economic hardship and, of course, political difficulties. And so we had a world in which, yes, I think you could argue they could have done more, but it was a world in which it was very, very difficult. This was not an excuse, but this, I think, is simply to recognize that even with the best will in the world, you can't always do something. The United States failed to join the League of Nations, the British turned more and more outwards towards their empire and turned their backs on Europe. This is a repeating pattern in, in, in British history, I think. And then, of course, the shock of depression drove politics to the extremes, either left-wing revolutionary extremes or right-wing nationalist and fascist extremes. We could argue, and I think it is clear, that they could have done better in the 1920s and 30s. They did do better after 1945, and that is because so many of those who were making the peace and setting up the institutions after 1945 had lived through the period of things going wrong. They had lived through the Great Depression. They had seen how erecting tariff barriers around the world had actually made things worse, had caused a precipitous decline in world trade, which had hurt pretty much everyone who was involved in trading. They could see what happened when you failed to confront dictators early enough on. And so in the post-1945 world, I think we have a very clear example of both good leadership and also learning from the mistakes of the past. The Breton Woods organizations that were set up to manage the world economy were very much a result of what went wrong in the 1920s and 1930s. And the United Nations and its allied organizations was again very much a reaction to what had gone wrong with the League of Nations and in the 1920s and 1930s and the European Union the foundations of which were laid in the period after 45 were very much an attempt by European powers to avoid the poisonous nationalisms which had so nearly destroyed Europe on two occasions. And so if we look at history and if we look at how we learn from it, I, I think the, the record is mixed. It can offer us warnings, it can offer us some hope, and it can offer us the possibility that we might do better next time. So I'll leave you with a question. How long will it take us to learn from this crisis 
and how much time do we have? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Margaret, for that for that overview. That was uh, really fascinating. And um, I have a couple of questions I'd like to ask, actually. Um, while I'm asking them, please, uh, we've had some great questions in already, but if you've got anything that you would like to ask Margaret, please type it down there in, in the Q&A box and I'll try and get to them as soon as we can. Um, Margaret, just before we move on to that, I wondered if we could talk about the idea of turning points in history, which seems to be, um, I mean, overused to the point of cliche, every major political event that has happened, it seems since in the last five years has been a major turning point in some way or another. Um, but we're seeing it used, particularly in the media, um, a lot to talk about the current pandemic and whether this really is a moment where society is at a turning point, whether it, things are going to be incredibly different as we begin to move out of the out of the uh, lockdowns that much of the world has put itself in. I just wondered, from a historian's perspective, how, how easy is it for people in the present to recognise whether things truly are turning points? Is this a useful way of thinking, or is this something that you kind of have to have a historian's hindsight to be able to judge? Well, speaking as an historian, I'd say it's too soon to tell. But <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> um, speaking as someone who's living through it, um, I have a sense that it's a turning point, and I may be wrong. A friend of mine said the other day, a year from now, things will be back to, as they were. We'll, we'll be forgetting about it. Life will be going on as usual. We'll have to see. We've, we've made a bet on it. Um, so this bottle of champagne riding on that particular bet. I think it is a turning point. I think for a couple of reasons, partly because it has brought out things that we were worrying about anyway. You know, there are already concerns about globalization, the concerns about the impact of, of the type of globalization we have, concerns about the growing gaps in a number of societies between the rich and the poor and the squeezing of the middle classes, concerns about the instability of, of a world order where the United States seemed to be withdrawing from the sort of engagement it had had before, and concerns about a growing tension between the United States and China, among other things. And so I think what the pandemic has done has brought those to the fore and made us much more aware. But I don't think, I don't, I don't see how we can go back to the way we were. I mean, apart from anything else, I think we're going to be more cautious in how we behave. I think we have all had a real scare. And I'm not sure we're going to move around as freely. I mean, I'm thinking myself, will I want to get on an airplane? Well, eventually, but perhaps not as easily as I once did. Will there be as much tourism? Maybe eventually. So I, I, I am tending to think it's, it's a turning point. Um, we don't know quite where that turning point is going to lead us, but I'm not sure my friend is right that we're all going to be back to normal in a year. Thanks very much. Um, we've got loads of questions in, so I just want to ask one more myself. And, and that's uh, something a little more specific, maybe. Now, a lot of the response to the coronavirus pandemic has been um, sort of debated at uh, a kind of multilateral level. The World Health Organization has obviously been front and center of the global response. I just wondered, thinking back to the, to the Spanish influenza and the aftermath of, of World War I, was global health on the radar, on the agenda for these kind of nascent multilateral organizations? Was it something that the League of Nations was supposed to be thinking about? Yes, I think there had been in the 19th century as the world moved towards becoming globalized. Of course, the period before 1914 was, was the other great period of globalization. And there had been an understanding that as the world became more interdependent, as there were more movements of people around the world, that disease was going to move as well. And the British, for example, had taken the lead with their empire in dealing with um, people going on, on pilgrimage, doing the Hajj to, to Mecca, for example, and, and then possibly bringing disease there or bringing disease back to, to India. And so, yes, there had been, and there was, there, there, were, it, there was an international sanitary commission which began to share information and began to take the first steps to dealing with, with health on a worldwide scale. So, yes, it was very much something they were thinking about. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on to some questions now. And thanks for everybody who's asked and, and keep them coming in as we go. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, so this one is from Christoph Federal. And he says, the 1918 pandemic mainly hit the young, whereas this coronavirus pandemic mainly hits the old 
from a health perspective, um, but the young from an economic perspective. And he's asking, is there a historical lesson from pandemics that predominantly hit the old? Can you think of a precedent? Um, no, I, ha I can't because the Black Death hit everyone mm. um, and carried away in some cases two thirds of the population. So I, suppo I suppose influenza epidemics, apart from the Spanish flu, do hit the elderly. I mean, the medical establishments wait every winter for the elderly to be carried off when, there's an, when, the, when there is flu, which can turn into, into pneumonia. But this one, I think, is, is particularly interesting for, for the medical profession and, and rather worrying for those of us who are over 70, because it does seem to fall disproportionately on the elderly. Okay, thank you. Um, and we've got a couple of questions um, around the threats that uh, that this that the lockdown and also the political upheaval caused by coronavirus will will pose. So we've got a question from Tina who says, "What threats do you think this pandemic poses uh, to democratic countries specifically?" But then we also have um, a related question from Paul Shuri who's asking, "Do you think that?" COVID is going to see a rise of nationalism and isolationism similar to that that we saw after World War One. I, I both, I think, are, 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 yes, very important questions. I think the impact on democratic societies can be to bring them together. And I think we're seeing that in a number of societies, but it can also bring, it, it can also bring existing divisions out. And I think we're seeing it in the United States where there's always been a tense relationship between the federal government and, and state governments. And I think we're seeing that um, with, of course, um, the, the, the very difficult relations between Democrats and Republicans exacerbating that. And so the danger is that you will get people behaving in one way in, in one part of the country in one way in another, and that will cause bad feeling. Um, you've already got states that are still doing a lockdown complaining that their neighbors aren't and, don't, and saying, we don't want people cars with your license plates coming in. We don't want you to spread the disease. I think there is also a danger that we will see nationalism. I mean, it, it's, it's extraordinary because the one thing we know about viruses, they don't respect borders. I mean, they are completely unnational but we are getting nationalist responses and we're getting, I think, what is dangerous in some countries, a tendency to blame immigrants. There was a very interesting article, I think, in the New York Times yesterday about how Asian Americans, particularly even you know, often doctors working in hospitals and, and medical staff working in hospitals are being shouted at, abused, being accused of, of spreading the virus. In India, the BJP, the governing BJP is trying to accuse Muslims of being carriers of the virus. So I think that there is a very nasty side to this and, and potentially a very dangerous one. Mm, absolutely. Continuing on this kind of the political effects route, we've got a question from um, Ignacio Perinat who is asking about what sort of power shift you think is likely to take place in the international order um, as we come out of this pandemic. Do you think that China is likely to gain more influence um, because of the way that they've dealt with this? Uh, will the West lose influence in the coming decade? And there's a related question um, from Richard Wright, uh, who says that crises are often resolved by changes in power structures. And um, in this pandemic, we've witnessed a total lack of any US global leadership and uh, world institutions have been shown to be somewhat weak in, in their ability to respond. So do you think that global power structures have irrevocably changed? I, I've, I fear that they have. I hope that they haven't. And I, I gain, and this is not taking refuge in, in being a historian. I think it's too soon to say. Mm. And it will depend, I think, partly on the results of the election in the United States. I think the record is still out on who's dealt most successfully with it. I mean, we, we know a lot about what's gone wrong in the United States because it's an open society and, and there's a free press. We have a good sense that things have not gone all that well in China. You know, the, the, the government initially did not appear to deal with it very well. And there was, there was I think, an attempt to cover up at, at, at the local level in Wuhan. And then the Chinese government seemed to be dealing with it quite well. But it's not clear, I think, yet that it's going to gain much international recognition for this. I mean, they've tried to use aid diplomacy and sending masks with a lot of fanfare and medical equipment, a lot of fanfare. But they, they have also, I think, undercut themselves by their bullying approach to those who criticize them. Um, their attacks on Australia, for example, for, for criticizing the, the, the new tone that a number, what do they call them, the wolf diplomats are taking 
on behalf of the Chinese government. So I'm not sure that China is necessarily going to come out of this seen as um, a replacement for the hegemony of the United States. I think there are a lot of reservations um, among those who've had to deal with China about how it's been dealing with it. So again, I think it's too soon to tell, but I think we are seeing a, a dangerous situation because international organizations are only as good as those who support them. And when you get the president of the United States saying, I want to cut off funding to the World Health Organization, this is not the time to be undercutting one of the key organizations which helps to maintain health throughout the world. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and now, uh, apologies guys for grouping these questions, um, but we're seeing some overlap in the themes that we want to bring out. So I've got a question here from Amal Ansari, who says, do you think pandemics such as COVID-19 um, lead to stronger and more powerful governments? Um, and do you think that that could be an impediment to society's well-being? So the power of the state. Um, and that's also echoed by Faye Sinclair, who um, actually says, don't you think that in a sense, fascism is is rearing its head again as lockdowns that the government are putting in are kind of acting to suppress civil liberties. Um, yeah. you think well, this? I think it is a worry. I mean, I think we want governments to take strong measures in moments of crisis because it's in all of our interests. I mean, we all want to be safe. Mm. And sometimes governments have to do things which they wouldn't do in normal circumstances and they have to take powers they wouldn't normally take. I mean, this happens during wars, of course. But what is concerning, I think, is, is the degree of surveillance that we may well be left with. And again, this is something that was already happening. I think we're perhaps becoming more aware of it now. But we already know, and we should know, that vast amounts of our personal data are held by the big tech companies. And it's not clear that it's, it's maintained always with complete security. I mean, there's been yet another data breach, um, in, this, in this case, an airline, where a lot of information has suddenly gone out there. And so I think it is a concern. And clearly monitoring and contact tracing is going to be very important in, in, in dealing with, with, with the outbreaks of the pandemic. But how much do we give up? It's going to be a debate, I think, that society has got to have. And I think there will be a danger that people say, what we want is a really strong leader who will just tell us what to do. And of course, you've got leaders like Viktor Orban in Hungary who are taking full advantage of the crisis to extend their powers, um, perhaps in his case indefinitely. And I think the nationalist rhetoric and, and the attacks on others and blaming others who aren't like us for spreading the virus is very dangerous indeed. But I think we've also seen some very good examples of powerful democracies responding very well. And if you think of New Zealand, for example, or you think of the Scandinavian countries, or you think of the ways in which Italy managed to deal with what was potentially a disastrous situation. So again, I think we, we, the, the record is very mixed and I think we shouldn't despair completely. I think there are things that we can take hope in. Thank you. Um, and actually, just to follow up on that, we've got a question thinking about the health of more authoritarian regimes um, in the wake of this. So uh, Rustam Kipshakbaev, apologies if I've pronounced your surname wrong, um, uh, asks, have you got any ideas on how um, the uh, anti-COVID measures will affect the stability of authoritarian regimes? Um, and how plausible would it be to extrapolate the, from the example of the rise of dictatorships that we saw after World War I? Yeah. It, it's, it, yeah, it, it's something to think about. I think, you know, one of the sort of implicit trade-offs in a dictatorship is that you lose some liberty, but we keep you safe and we look after you and we defend you. And if the authoritarian government can't do that, then that implicit bargain comes under attack. And I think what's happening in Russia is very, very important indeed. Um, there's a lot of discontent in Russia the government is not, I think, being open about how many people have got the virus, what the death rate is. I mean, before they even admit it, for a long time, Russia was saying they didn't have it at all. All through February and, and early March, Russia was saying we don't have the virus here. Although people were noticing an awful lot of people were dying of pneumonia more than usual. And I think Putin's response has been lackluster. In many cases, you, you've had, you, what, what is interesting now is you have some of the big, powerful billionaires stepping in and you have local governors stepping in. And I think that is undermining what has been one of the key claims that he has to power is that I keep you safe. And I think he isn't. And I think we're seeing Erdogan, President Erdogan in Turkey, I think has not dealt particularly effectively with the crisis and is being seen not to have dealt effectively. And so I think it can undermine them and can lead to an undercurrent of, of discontent. You know, if you don't keep your side of the bargain, then what are you doing in office? Mm. Um, just on this 
question of um, who has been handling the crisis well or not. And I know that there's a lot of debate around the statistics, etc. But um, Neil McLeod um, has a sort of different perspective on this, which is that it feels like small countries have been able to handle this crisis better than than some of the kind of traditional great powers. Um, and he asked, do you think this is the end of the, the large nation state? Do you think it's useful to be thinking in terms of great powers anymore? Yeah. I think we're going to have great powers with us for, for a considerable amount of time. I don't think that's going to disappear anytime soon. But I think what is coming out, and you know, we're still in the middle of it, so, so what we are learning is still very, very much debated. There are many things we don't yet know. I mean, we, we don't even know if a lot of the data are accurate or the ways in which it's collected in one country are comparable to the ways in which it's collected in another country. But I think what we're seeing is that you can be over-centralized, that you need a strong central government to take the lead, but often local governments and smaller governments are best at dealing with their own localities. Uh, they know what their people will put up with. They, they understand the local power structures. They understand how to talk to local people. And I think in the case of the United Kingdom, I think there is now a powerful argument of which a number of people are making for more power to be handed back to local councils and regional governments to let them do the testing rather than trying, for example, to centralize it, to have a number of centers to encourage people actually to participate. Um, Cambridge University and Oxford University, the other universities were saying right from the beginning, we could do a lot of the testing because we already have labs and the government didn't take them up on it. And I think what we're seeing is that we need a combination of international action, strong central government action, but also more power to local governments. Thank you very much. Um, now, you touched on leadership in your in your presentation. Um, we've had a couple of questions in about that, but um, we've got one here from Mike Gapes, um, who says, you spoke about leadership and the importance of the choice of good advisors. Um, FDR had many good advisors and cabinet appointments. Who do you think is going to be the Francis Perkins of this era? Uh, the Francis Perkins or the Harry Hopkins. I mean, that was the thing about Roosevelt. He, he wasn't afraid of, of powerful and, and intelligent people. He didn't always listen to them. But what he did, and what I think other good presidents did, was, was let them argue it out as well. I think if you're going to be a good leader, you've got to be aware of what the possible alternatives are that are being debated by, by those who, who, who know what they're talking about. I don't know who's going to be the Francis Perkins of our time. That's, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I would say just, just Jacinta Ardern, but she's already prime minister. But she seems to me to have that capacity to think about society as a whole, as Francis Perkins did, and, and to worry about those who are at the bottom levels of society to make sure that they don't get neglected. Mm. Thanks. And, and just to carry on on this, uh, on this leadership thread, we've got a question from Jean-Emile Nobola, um, who is asking really about the, the role of the leader in responding to these crises. And obviously we've talked about the kind of structural, the, the policies and the measures that governments can put in place. But he says, in terms of turning this crisis into um, an opportunity for positive change, how important do you think it is that leaders are able to tell a, a positive message about this? How much, how do you think, how important do you think narrative is gonna be in, in our sort of emergence out of this crisis? Well, I think it is important as long as the narrative is based on fact. I think if you get a narrative which says, you know, tomorrow the rainbow is going to appear and the bluebirds will sing and everything's going to be okay, then I think after a while well, they're all going to stop believing it. But if you have leaders who have shown that they can be truthful, have shown that they can talk directly to their people, I and mean, communication is enormously important here, I think, in, in the world in which we live and, and has always been. But if you look at the leaders who seem to have been successful and whose approval ratings are high, they are the ones who have talked to the people in their countries as if they're grown-ups. Uh, Angela Merkel, I think, is a very good example of this. She hasn't pulled her punches. She hasn't told the German people it's going to be easy. She said it's going to be difficult. We're going to, have to do lots of things you're not going to like, but it's important we do it. And again, in, in New Zealand, Prime Minister Ardern, who's, I think the approval rating of the government is now at something like 90%. I mean, it's, it's absurdly high in a, way, in a way, but I think she has been, and we've all seen her talking, she's been very direct. She said, it's not going to be easy. We're not going to tell you that it's all going to be okay tomorrow. And I, I think that is enormously important because if people can see for themselves, friends and neighbors getting illnesses, being taken off to hospital, I mean, you know, in, it, in parts of Italy, everybody must know someone who died, must have a family member or a friend who died or who was seriously ill. And that will be true in other societies as well. And if the government 
keeps denying what is actually happening on the ground, then I think the government will lose credibility. So I think those leaders, my view is those who can speak directly and, and simply say, this is not easy, but we're doing our best and say what they're gonna do and admit, you know, we tried something, it didn't work, we're gonna try something else. I think they will come out well. And I think we should remember that. Thank you. And uh, we've got a, a question now on the, uh, on the security implications um, of this crisis. And it's, it's from Simon Webb and he draws on an example from much further ago, actually, um, on the Great Fire of London and the aftermath in which, in which a Dutch um, army raided Chatham in the UK um, mm. at, to try and take advantage, I suppose, of, of the uh, presumed weakness and the chaos that had ensued. Um, he says, do you think security planners need to hedge off the risk of expansionist countries trying to take military advantage from this crisis? Yes, I think we always do. And I think it's quite true that during this crisis, so many of us have been focused on the crisis itself. I mean, if you look at the newspapers, the daily newspapers, or you watch television, it's COVID, 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 which is because we're all fascinated by it. But in the meantime, I think we're not paying enough attention to what is going on in, say, between India and Pakistan. They're still shooting across the border at each other. In fact, it's probably gone, the incidence has probably gone up rather than down. The increasingly aggressive actions of the Chinese in the South China Sea, I think, is something we should be worrying about. Because I think it, it will be a temptation for nations to try and extend their influence in ways that perhaps the rest of us wouldn't like. When we're preoccupied with something else. And yes, I, I agree. I think it is something. And I think let's hope that there are people in the military establishments and the foreign policy establishments of key powers who are keeping an eye on this because it is something we need to look at. We've had several questions in uh, on the subject of information and disinformation um, around, around crises such as coronavirus. Um, and We've got one particular from Christian Rauch, who is asking, is there any historic evidence of conspiracy theories becoming more prevalent when crises such as pandemics are ongoing? Like, is there anything that you've got from your experience there? Yes, unfortunately, there is evidence. I mean, I think it's a natural human thing. Something awful happens mm. and you want someone to blame for it. And with the Black Death, of course, there, there, was, there was a rise in anti-Semitism and attacks and, and murders of Jews who were accused of, of spreading, deliberately spreading the Black Death. And it's, you know, we're getting something similar again, certainly in, in the wilder fringes of our society, people saying that it was created in a lab in China. There's no evidence that it came out of any laboratory. And, and the scientists who've looked at the structure of the virus, the molecular structure of the virus, are saying, no, you know, it, it, is, it is a naturally occurring event. It doesn't look like it was man-made at all. But I think there will be a temptation to blame others for it and, and to try and find scapegoats. And, and we're seeing, unfortunately, quite a bit of that at the moment. We're coming towards the end now. So I, I think um, I've just got one area that I'd like to touch on, and that's to do with our relationship to our environment. We've had a few questions um, come in about that. I've got one here from Peter Wilhelmsen, who, who says that so far during the coronavirus pandemic, it seems that big international cities have been particularly badly hit. Um, perhaps worse than, than other areas. Do you think that this crisis will have any impact on um, the massive trend towards urbanization and countrysides emptying out and everyone moving to live in mega cities that we were reading about so much in, in previous years? And more broadly, we've had another couple of questions also about whether crises like this um, lead us to reconsider our relationship to the natural world and the environment. Well, what will it do for cities? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of talk about how people will find they'd rather live in the country, that they can work from home. I don't know. I mean, the great advantage cities, cities have is that so much is going on in them. And if you want something done, you can usually find someone to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think people are finding already that they, they miss their offices. You know, they would like to see other people, that there is an important social function at the office place. I'm not sure. That's maybe where we go back to normal a bit more quickly. It may not, may, well, although it may not be, we may see more people wanting to move to smaller villages, but you know, small villages have their disadvantages as well as their pluses. And so I'm not sure we should be too sentimental about the joys of living in a small village or the joys of living in a big city. I mean, both have their pluses and negatives. As far as the natural world goes, yes, we're noticing that we can see the stars and, and yes, we can hear the birds. And we are aware that areas that were heavily polluted have higher death rates 
from the virus, a higher incidence of the virus in north of Italy, for example, um, certain cities, because they're heavily polluted, have had a higher incidence. And I think that has given us all something to think about. But will we actually start doing something serious about climate change when this particular crisis is over? I worry that we won't because we can deal with a crisis like a world war or a stock market crash or a sudden pandemic because they are limited in time or will eventually be limited in time. The trouble with the climate crisis, and it's of course the most serious one I think in many ways facing humanity, is that we can always push it out. We can always say, well, it'll, you know, we'll figure something out in 20 years, we've got time. And I think that has got us into this or helped to get us into this present situation. And I worry that once things calm down, we will not go on and try and do something about the things that are happening to our climate. And, and that I think is worrying because I think we really are running out of time. Um, we may not feel that we are, but I think we are. And certainly in times of history, when historians tend to think in centuries, um, we don't have that much time left before the effects really begin to hit us very, very hard indeed. I mean, they already are. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time and there were so many questions coming in. I, I apologise that we weren't able to get to more of them, um, but thank you very much for submitting them. Um, Margaret, I just want to ask one final thing. Obviously, we've spoken so much um, about all sorts of different facets of this crisis um, today, uh, a very wide ranging overview, but um, a lot of it's obviously very concerning. I just wondered if you had any sort of green shoots of positivity, anything, any examples that you have seen so far during this crisis that are making you think um, that maybe international society is, is beginning to get its act together? Or have, what do you have on that for optimism? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you are, because I'd like to end on a positive note rather than a gloomy one. Yes, I think so. I mean, I think what the crisis has made us realize is that we are interdependent. I mean, there may be a temptation to want to pull up the drawbridges, but you know, if you think about it, you can't do it. That, that's not how you deal with contagious illnesses. They, they spread at their, as they will. And you know, they're carried by, the, the, the bird flu was carried by birds who, who don't know what a national border is. They, they fly thousands of miles often. So yeah, I think that has been good. And I think perhaps for our societies, it's also made us realize that there are things we value which don't have a price. You know, we've tended to think in terms of price as setting value. Um, we've tended to think, you know, if it, if it costs this much, it must be good. And I don't think we, I think we're moving away from that. We're recognizing that although people can be paid a lot, they may not be the most valuable members of society. We're recognizing how important people like care workers, the badly paid staff in, in, in the hospitals are. And I think perhaps we will look again at our societies and, and think, can we do a bit better? And the fact, I think, which is encouraging that governments who've been saying you know, for decades now, we have to balance the books, we have to have austerity, are suddenly spending, I don't want to be unkind to sailors, so I won't say drunken sailors, but they're suddenly spending with very free hands. And I think having seen that, I'm not sure we can go back and say, oh, we've got to go back to the old ways, um, because we've seen that it is possible for governments to do the sorts of things which they hadn't thought they could do before. Absolutely. Well, that's, a, that's an amazing place to end. Thank you so much today, Margaret McMillan, for joining us. Uh, and thank you also to everybody who, who joined to listen and who contributed such fantastic questions. Um, enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are, and uh, tune in for the next webinar, which is going to be next week. Uh, Margaret, thanks again. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks. <laughs>